For a conversation on this, we now turn to a professor of economics and an international finance expert, Professor Ken Ife. He will be speaking on the funding modalities for students' loan and how far can what has been provided for cover students with the extant high cost of living. Good to have you on Arise News. Thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. Thank you for having me. Now, Professor, I'd like to have your take on the students' loan scheme being fully automated to prevent human interference, knowing how the Nigerian society works and, of course, the technical glitches that are likely to occur. Is this strategy well thought out? I think the intentions are, are marvelous. Uh, we have memories, of, we have sweet memories of the time of uh, Awolowo when he opened this up. And there are so many beneficiaries. Many of them have been ministers that benefited from this scheme. So the conceptual framework for the scheme is sound. And there are so many good features about it. One is that it's going on interest-free loan, which is good. Two is that it's, uh, it's inclusive. So it's uh, not restricted to any particular category of people. It's open and inclusive. And Three is going to be transparent process, and it's going to be underpinned by technology. Technology makes the whole difference, um, and I'm so glad that it's going to be connected to BVN because once BVN comes into the picture, that's going to help us when we start recovering the loan because you have what they call GSI, Global Standing Instruction, which is what the government may resort to if there are defiance and then they begin to claw back resources together. So there are many things there. It's sustainable because it's anchored on a, a sustainable fund, which is the Education Trust Fund. And I also like the idea that it opens up to skills because what we hear in the education sector is build schools, 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 thousands of schools in every state, but not build skills, 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 what leads you to employment and self-employment. So we now have that disconnect between all the people that get all these academic degrees, including myself, and disconnect from the real skills profile required by the industry and the jobs. Uh, so, so now we are going to bridge that gap. But I also think that we need to be reaching out to the ITF money, which is for skills for those in employment, if possible, and then find out that way to, to support, because when you go into skills, already we have so much need on the education sector. So there may be way, you know, ways of trying to find out where else we can reach out to, to get some more money. ETS, just adding 0.5% to Education Trust Fund, will bring some reasonable amount of money on the table. But I also think that we should look at an endowment component because if somebody has benefited from this program and turned out to become a billionaire, he may say, okay, he could give back five billion or two billion to this fund, you know, to ensure that more people benefit. So we'll have to keep all these doors open. And, you know, still on that line of more money with this cost of living crisis that we have seen engulf the country, albeit the world, um, and it seems like it might just get a little bit worse before it gets... Uh, better. Is it enough money for these students to um, advance themselves or would they be putting themselves in a situation where the money is almost enough but for the next couple of years of their life they're paying that off? No, if you see how it works, I don't think we should be discouraged about how much money is available. Now let's look, take a longer term view of this scheme is going to be extremely beneficial. It's going to correct a lot of anomalies in our system. One is the, it, the devil is in the implementation, without a doubt. So that was why I was happy that the computer system is going to be involved, I've been issue. But see what happens. First of all, there is a flat fee. There's a, 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 there is a group in two stages. You have stage one, which is about tuition fees. Now, tuition fees are known as schools and vary from schools to school, so tuition fees get settled. Then there's a second one, which is maintenance, if that is in the picture. Maintenance is means tested. Um, that means they need to test the means of your parents if you are going to require more than the threshold. Now, let's say for the case of England, the threshold for maintenance is £3,600, which means £300 a month for the student to enable them to pay their accommodation and maintain themselves. But it could go up to 10000 depending on a sliding scale of the income of your parents above 25000 
So that is a determination, and computer works it out very, very quickly. The second thing is that that money for the school fees must go straight to the university or to the polytechnic. No, no, nobody, no cash in hand. Then you now have to decide what happens to the money that belongs to the student. I think the students should get their money because, in the end of the day, they are the ones that are obliged. They are going to have to pay this money back. Um, uh, and then also, if you start giving that particular money to university, they may start cutting all kinds of costs, like in, 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 what they call it. They will may start deducting uh, handout fee, that, 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 and that creates problem with them as students. So anyway, but that's that's a matter of administration. Then in terms of repayment, ten years is given. Uh, standard for repayment, and there has to be over an income threshold. In the case of UK, it's over twenty-five thousand pounds. If you earn more than twenty-five thousand pounds, then for undergraduates, your money is nine percent, and then for postgraduate, it's actually six percent of your income over twenty-five thousand. Uh, pounds. So you can see again, because somebody could get a postgraduate degree after a year and is still carrying the burden of the, the, the undergraduate uh, loan. So that's why it's, it's attenuated at the level of postgraduate. So all that kind of thing is it's a beautiful scheme, but we just have to make sure that we don't create, we have bad eggs and bad experience that will create public outcry and diminish the, 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 the benefits that this is really going to bring. Now, since the federal government is extending the scheme to cover vocational skills, I'm wondering if we have enough vocational institutions to cater to those who wish to go through this route, or will we simply be transferring funds you know, to wealthy elites who usually train apprentices? Oh, it's not about transferring funds, because there are, there are, you have to have a value. Uh, there's a value, you know, you have to determine the value of a service that is being given. And it's not just vocational skills at the uh, uh, apprenticeship level or intermediate level. It also involves graduate level skills. Okay, my children in London, I usually have to encourage them and then I pay for them to those who do software engineering and computer engineering, I encourage them and I pay for them to do Cisco networking, uh, Microsoft uh, things. I do all those professional things that give them an edge. And those who did engineering, and I, I pay for them to do 1,000 pounds or 1,800 for them to do project management uh, 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 skills, which is, uh, which is professional. And then also those who did law, I pay for them to do special course on law, on contract law that gives them an edge. So there are professional courses at a graduate level that gives them that edge in terms of employment. Then, of course, at the vocational skill level, then you have a, a variety of things. And don't forget that the cost may not be an arm and a leg, because when you go to employer-based training, employers may well be ready to contribute. Uh, their problem is that they don't want to train somebody to become a training institution just by employing anybody, train them, and the time you are going to use them, they bugger off. And then you, you now become a training company rather than a, a productive company. So, so that's one of the concerns of this. But if you do structure it well, you will see employers that would like to contribute to this because you're actually doing something where you are learning those skills within the company. So that's a, that's a, a big plus. But I don't think it's going to drain the economy in the way people are going to. The people are going to scream because there will be lack of experience and lack of a, a good practices to show that this is going to work and make a huge difference in our economy. We lack skills. We lack human resource development. We're just not investing enough. All right. And the FIRS uh, Executive uh, Secretary, uh, Mr. Sawyer, he said that with this student loan um, scheme, it's going to stem the tide of uh, the jackpot syndrome we've been seeing with more students being able to retain and uh, complete their education here in Nigeria. Is this something you also agree with? No, definitely, without a doubt. It's, 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 we're not saying our people shouldn't go abroad. I mean, if they're not going abroad, how would you get over $26 billion as, as a as, as a diaspora remittance. Are you going to turn the remittance down because you think that they shouldn't be going abroad? The issue is, is even the cost of that vocational training, a lot of it are down because of e-learning. So, you know, people can still stay wherever they are and learn, and then you can show, uh, when you look at the results, you can actually see um, an audit trail of the courses that they did, the months that they did, the exam that they did on section by section. So that is not, it's not an issue. But the fact is that when you are dealing with vocational skills, work-based training, they are training at the workplace. 
they are generating skills that immediately resonate with employers. And if you don't have employers employ you, you employ yourself. Over 60% of our, of our employment are from a, a soft economy. You know, this is a, you know, small businesses, micros, MSMEs, generating 90% of the employment. So the people will have the capacity to employ themselves. And there's no shortage of that in the country. And don't forget again that with AI and all this whole programming, and people can stay here and work abroad. And then you look at India, what they are doing on, um, on, on uh, all kinds of skills, uh, the software environment, and uh, even, the, even the services from companies abroad, and they're doing them from home. They're not all of them are not in America. If, I'm, if all the people involved in India do in this industry go to America, they will double the population of America. But the fact of the matter is that we need those skills, digital literacy skills, and, and an enhancement of those digital literacy when it comes to vocational options. So we need to develop those skills. They can make more money for you from here, and, um, and it's not going to cost an arm and a leg. Uh, Professor, are you worried that the federal government has not given a specific date for the commencement of this scheme, especially as we are nearing the end of January, which initially was earmarked you know, as the start-up month? I, I'm not worried because I feel, don't forget, this government has not even spent eight, nine months. So there are too many things on the table. The intention is very clear. The commitment is there. But if you, miss, if, if you misfire by not getting properly ready and then not having the system tuned and tested the, the computer system that is going to manage this, if you end up calling people and giving them cash and you don't have all the trades, you're not going into their bank account and you begin to, you know, it, you're just going to bring a bad reputation on the program. It's rather that you, 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 you get it right from the first go than that you rush things and then you just get into um, you know, a very, very messy situation. So I think the government has tried, actually, because they didn't have to wait for a whole year before they could begin this. Um, otherwise, they could say, well, you know what, we just got sworn in April, in May, we just have to start this uh, 2024, September. So give us the, the, a break. But they're, they're anxious to get this going. And so we should, we should uh, bear a little bit with them to get it right. And I'm glad you brought that up, the testing of these new technologies and systems, because as we saw during our election uh, period, there were glitches to our system, uh, but there were tests that were carried out beforehand. And because of the glitches, things reverted to manual. Now, in this case, we know that it's going to be uh, human contact, less as it's been described, and it's going to be through an app. In the, in the un, unfortunate uh, e eventuality that the system does not run as efficiently as it is supposed to be, what is the likelihood that they will revert to doing manual cash transfers? And how could that affect the, um, the overall execution and um, dignity of uh, this student loan scheme? Well, that is, the, that is the worry. There shouldn't be any issue on, um, on the tuition fee because that is going direct to the university. And then that can be activated quickly. As soon as you, you validate and you approve, then the money can reach straight away to the university and you can return the money. From the university can return the money based on the agreement that they sign with the authority. So that should not be any problem at all. The problem is, uh, is administration of the maintenance money that has to go to students. Then, of course, I think we should also get parents or guardians to sign, to sign documents, because we do sign. Um, because you need, need to sign and put your means tested income so that they will be able to uh, graduate it. Um, otherwise, everybody may have to start at a basic one, which is, uh, as I gave you before, the example I gave before was about 3,600 pounds in, in UK. So if we, if we are not ready, if the system is not ready to deal with the graduated assessment on a sliding scale, I can understand because that, that means you also have to look at the, what has been declared to inland revenue, the tax receipts and all that sort of stuff. So we could excuse that and begin by doing a, 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 a simple minimum uh, 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 maintenance until such a time as our system is in a position to do that. But you've got the GSI, You've got the, the, uh, the bank verification number. You've got somebody that signed as a parent or guardian, um, you know, some, something there that you can hold to. And then um, you can get a minimum start for the program. 
And then over time, you may begin to look at those uh, hardship, most people who are most hit by, you know, all those ones can come later. Because that is where the system would be, would be required. It's going to be predicated on, have you actually tested that these parents are actually uh, uh, correct in the amount that they stated as their revenue? And where is the evidence from tax? Because you can also go direct to FIRS to confirm that this family that said that their income is 200,000 Naira, that it is the case. Uh, which is the basis for you to give additional money over the threshold. So we may just work with threshold for now, pay for tuition, those are easier to deal with. And then over time, we can, we can approach a much more complex uh, system that would um, uh, test the means. Now, I'd like to follow up on something you said earlier about repaying the loans. You know, you talked about students that might find it difficult to get jobs, you know, employing themselves. But considering the harsh economic climates that we find ourselves in right now, even employers of labor are finding it very difficult, you know, to survive in their businesses. So I'm wondering if while rolling out this student's loan scheme, shouldn't we also be talking about job creation? Because without jobs, how then will they pay back these loans? Well, the, the, the route, the clear route and pathway to job creation is skills. You know, you can't, you can't overstate that fact. It's skills, because there are more employers looking for uh, the skills than the supply available. So when you look in and I explain that it's not just the, the vocational skills of, at, 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 the, at the intermediate level, it's also at the graduate level, and it's also at the postgraduate level, professional skills. If an accountant that is trained as an accounting uh, degree was able to access resources to do ACCA, one, two, three, and become a chartered accountant as it's come, I mean, he can employ himself, what's he looking for a job for? I mean, so many MSMEs looking for accountants to help them. And in the same way with uh, engineers, you know, who has uh, experience on electrical design and he's got the certificate, he's got that, and he's and registered and, as a professional person and, and, and by this, they can go out to work and they go and test, uh, have kits to test installations, to do that, to do work. They can employ themselves. Nigerians are not shy. They are, we have, look, there are 90 million MSMEs in Africa. Of this MSA means 48% are from Nigeria, 42 million. Now, the Nigerian population is about 18% of Africa population. Our GDP is about 18 to 20% of Africa GDP. But our entrepreneurship is 48%. So there is something there about Nigeria that we are more entrepreneurial. We have more people that are prepared to take risks. All they just need, give them the basic foundation, which is let them have a skill. You know, many students now are having to learn hairdressing. They have to learn uh, shoemaking, fashion design, all of that, makeup, artistry, so that they can survive at school and pay the school fees, not, not only themselves, but their siblings who have not entered the university. So this is, there is real. They are doing this. And, they, and you can't tell me that 220 million people, the demand of this population cannot be met by the thing. And in the service sector, service sector grows phenomenally. That's what giving us the growth. And if you look at ICT and banking and finance area, finance is growing at about 18%, and then it's about 5% of our, of our GDP, and ICT is 9.8%, and it's about 16% of our GDP, and trade is 16% of our GDP. So these guys, we are traders, and if you look for loan, they won't even give you loan if it is about manufacturing something, but everybody who wants to trade for three months loan, they'll give it to you. So uh, the, we have the capacity, we have the opportunities, and our, we have an import-dependent economy. These are the skills that will get us out of this, uh, that, that mess that we, we have, we inherited as structural de deformity. Well, Professor Ken Ife, thank you so much for this discussion this afternoon and for joining us here on Newsday. <laughs>